people that are so sincere but have a wrong concept of God feel that they can't approach him can't go through the Lord Jesus they have to go through saints meaning well sincere and other folks that even know Christ and know the word of God have a strange approach and a thought of God is so important to understand God, who he is, and who he really is, 
and how to worship him and to reach him. So there's a great lesson for us in the word of God in John's gospel, the 14th chapter. I want to start reading at the sixth verse. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says to them, Jesus said to him, he's speaking at the, at the seventh verse of the 14th chapter. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it's sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, to Philip, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father's in me? The words that I speak to you, I don't speak on my own authority, but the father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the father and the father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So important, Jesus spoke to him and said, if Philip, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. He is saying that Jesus Christ, Jesus came a revelation of God to us. He was God in the form of a man. God came down in the form of Jesus that we could understand him and, un and relate to him and know him. All of this Bible is so important. But the most important part of all of this book are the 60, 69 chapters that are in the four gospels. These chapters, all but four of them, deal with three and a half years of Jesus' ministry on this earth. All of, all of this book, all of the Old Testament is foretelling, is foretelling and bringing us to, to the fact of the Gospels. After the four Gospels, all of the rest of the book is explaining the four Gospels. All of the four Gospels, 85 chapters, with the exception, there's 89, but with the exception of four, 85 of them deal with three and a half years, the most important years ever lived. Jesus Christ came in those three and a half years, these 85 chapters describe Jesus Christ, God, came down in the form of Jesus, God in him. And Jesus said that to, to Philip, and he said, Philip, don't you realize that if you've seen me and you hear me, you're hearing God, I have came to reveal him. What the Father is in me, and I am in him. And God wants us to understand and study this. This is the most important piece of literature ever written. Nothing ever written in all the history of the world, nothing is as important as these chapters, these 69, 89 chapters that are in these four gospels. They're the most important of all the world. The four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they describe God. Here you can see who God is, how he really is. Jesus Christ was born uh, in, a, in, a, in a place for animals, really, and laid in a manger, probably sheep, because that was mainly what they had. No doubt it was a barn for the sheep. And Jesus Christ was born without a home. No home and had nothing and realized that to understand poverty, understand the poor, he understands them. And later on in, in, in his ministry, a young man came to him and said one day, I will go with you anywhere. As Jesus said, young man, don't you realize 
Foxes have holes at night they go into. And birds have wonderful nests in the trees that they go to at the end of the day. But the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. I don't have a home. I am homeless. I don't have a home. Why? Because he wanted to, uh, to experience and suffer. He knows what homelessness is like. He understands it. He has compassion. He came with nothing. And di divested himself of all of the glory and everything of heaven that he had. And came down at the very bottom. So that nobody would ever feel beneath him. He went to the bottom that he could pick up the lowest and the ones at the bottom, the homeless, those that have nothing. He has been there. He understands it. He has compassion. And he started and suffered and came down at the bottom that he would feel for everybody, for every person. And he is a God of compassion. One of the great words that describes Jesus is compassion. It describes God. He had compassion. He had compassion on the hungry. It says he, those folks that followed him for two or three days and had nothing and the food had all gone. And if one little boy, I don't know how he got there and how he kept his lunch, but he had five little loaves and two little fish. And out of thousand, five thousand 5,000 men besides women and children, about fifteen to 20,000 people, all they've had was five little teeny loaves and two little fish. And Jesus said he had compassion. He felt for those hungry people. And he said, I can't send them home. I've got to see a miracle. I'm going to, I'm going to believe God. He was God in the flesh. And he took those little loaves and blessed them and prayed. And when he broke them, it fed, it multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. And, uh, you know, I, how many fish? I guess every one of those men ate three or four of those fish. And could you imagine he multiplied those two fish in, into about 50 or 60,000 fish? And he multiplied those bread into thousands of breads and then fed them all they wanted. And he didn't say, it wasn't one of these restaurants that said, that's it and that's no more. No, 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 no. He said, all you want, praise God, all you want. And he gave those hungry men and those women all they wanted. But he said something interesting that gives you an insight into, into God's nature. He says, gather up the fragments that nothing is wasted. God does not waste anything. He is not a waster. He said, gather it up. I've often wonder what he did with those 12 baskets, but I'm sure he told the folks that had the long, largest distance, this way I think, that he told the ones that had the great distance, you take a lunch home with you. You take something home with you because you're going to be hungry on the way home. Compassion, caring. He was a caring God. He is a caring. He cares about you. He cares about details. He cares about the, your children. He cares. And that was a wonderful picture of Jesus is when the when the, the disciples were all with him and they were organizing his meetings and some women wanted their, to bring their babies to Jesus and have him bless them and uh, they would say no he hasn't got time for that this is Jesus he hasn't got time for, for your babies get those children out of here we've got big things to do Jesus said wait a minute hold steady let those mothers bring those children to me he sat down and took those children into his arms, beautiful, and blessed them. I've often thought of what happened to those little girls and little boys that he put his hands on their head and blessed them. And he taught those disciples something. God cares about everybody. He cares about the children. He cares about the elderly. He cares about the sick. He's a caring God, a compassionate God, a caring God, a, an approachable God. He let those, those folks approach him. He was approachable. I love him. I, I love the story of when he was coming at the end of his ministry. 
He was coming up from Jericho to Jerusalem to make his last, his final trip. And on the way up, there was a beggar, Brian Bartimaeus. Brian Bartimaeus screamed. He heard Jesus is coming by, the healer. The compassionate, great healer is coming by. And the crowds in Bartimaeus called out, Jesus! He called out and they said, keep still, you beggar. He hasn't got time for you. Hush up, you blind beggar. And, and Bartimaeus jumped out and screamed out louder. He couldn't see where he was, but he heard him. And he screamed out and Jesus stopped the whole crowd. He said, Bartimaeus, he says, come over here. I've got time for you. Stop the crowd. What would you like me to do for you? And he says, that I could see, that I could see. Jesus put his hands on Bartimaeus. His eyes were open. And Bartimaeus joined the crowd. Hallelujah. He got in behind. And those guys looked around. Boy, look at Jesus. He cares about the blind. He cares about those that nobody else. He's a caring God. An incredible heart reaching out to the lost and the dying and the caring. The greatest characteristic, of course, of all is his love. His love. He was moved with love. Loved, loved people. And I, I think of the story of in, the, in John's gospel uh, in the 13th chapter when, when he heals Lazarus and uh, when he raises Lazarus from the dead. And uh, he's walking to the funeral, walking to where he's going to pray for him and he's crying. And it says, and the people all said, look how he loved him. Look how he loved that man. He loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He loved them. And he was caring. And he knew it was going to raise him. But he felt as they cried. He felt for those going to the funeral. He feels when you cry. He feels when you suffer. He is a feeling God. He feels. Now, this is a wonderful thing about God is that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Exactly what he was in these, in these 85 chapters is exactly what he is today. He has not changed one iota. He is that. So study these chapters. Read this whole Bible, but, but concentrate on these gospels and get Jesus and his picture into you because that is who he is. He is the same. He hasn't changed. He is the same today. Jesus Christ is the same. And he said we can come to the Father through him because he took our sins like we sang so beautifully and acquired did such a great job, sang so wonderfully, so wonderfully. He took all of our sins away and now we can go through our Savior and that's the heart of God. He is a caring God. He's a loving God and he loved us with an incredible love, a love that's past understanding. His love is so great, his caring and the, 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 of course, the greatest verse in all of the Bible is John 3, 16, where it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved us enough that he took his son, his only son, and had his son put to death and had his son take our sins and turned his back on him and made his son a sacrifice. The greatest picture of this, of course, in the Old Testament is Abraham. When God said to Abraham, the father, it had to be the father of the Jewish nation. Abraham, saddest story in all of the Old Testament and the most touching. It just overwhelms me when I read it. God said, Abraham, Take your son Isaac that you love, your only son, and take him to a mountain that I'll show you, probably Mount Calvary, no doubt, and take him a three days journey and you offer him as a living sacrifice. Kill your son that you love me more than your son. And I've often thought those three days, the saddest days in any man's person's life in all of the Bible, Abraham took Isaac. And when they get there, Isaac says to his father, he says, Dad, 
Where is the sacrifice? Where, he said, we, you've got the wood, and you've got the fire, and you've got the knife. But where is the sacrifice, Dad? And at some point in those three, they, in that journey up the hill now, they've, got, they've gone three days. It's just to walk up the mountain to Mount Calvary. And he says, he has to tell him, Isaac, you are the sacrifice. Isaac, because Jesus cried and prayed, Isaac begged his father, begged him to die. You, you, I'm going to die. And Abraham, tears streaming out of his eyes, his heart bleeding, bound his son's legs and bound his son's arms and laid Isaac on that altar and put the fire under him and drew the knife back. Tears streaming down his face. Isaac crying out. Turns his head. The angel grabbed his arm. Says, Abraham, don't touch him. And talk about a shout and prayer. Talk about a time of praise when they saw that ram in the bushes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> praise God. But with God's son, he didn't, he didn't stop. The knife went in him. And Jesus hung. God turned his face from him. And he bore our sins and our troubles and our sicknesses. All of my sins were placed upon him. As God turned his back. God so loved the world. And Paul said, if God gave us his son, wouldn't he give you anything you need? Won't he provide for you? He gave you his son. He so loved you that he put his son on the cross that you could come into the family. God's love is eternal. And this life is brief, folks, and we're going to spend eternity with him. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But I want to tell you this morning, now he is a forgiving God because of Calvary. He is a forgiving God. It doesn't matter what your sins are. He will forgive your sins. And a member of our own family had a problem with forgiveness. We we're so painful. Well, God, uh, will God forgive this? Will he forgive? Listen, God will forgive you. He will forgive your sins. He will wipe them away. What a picture of Jesus Christ in the eighth chapter of the gospel of John when they catch this woman, an adulteress, and, they, and they're supposed to stone her under the law, and they bring her out to Jesus, and, and they say, the law of Moses says, stone this woman. She was in adultery. We caught her this morning in adultery, and they were ready with the stones, and Jesus wrote, spoke bent down and rolled on the ground. I don't know what he wrote. And, and uh, ben looked up and they're still there. And he wrote, writes and all of them. And he says, the one that has never sinned here, you cast your first stone at this woman. You start it off. The perfect one of you that's without sin, you do this, you start it off. And they wasn't one of them that wasn't, that didn't have sin. And from the oldest, they dropped their stones and walked away. Finally, Jesus is still writing. He looks up and they're all gone. And he says to the woman, where are your accusers? They're all gone. He says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. And with that power to live an overcoming life. He, did not, he came not to put you down. He came not to condemn the world. And I've often been too condemning. He came not to condemn the world. He's not a condemner. He's a savior. Hallelujah. Let's praise him this morning. He didn't come to condemn. 
He didn't come to tell you how bad you were. He didn't come. He came to reach down and to lift you up and to save you and to forgive you and to wash your sins away. And he came. Oh, if I could only make it the way it is. I can't, but the Holy Spirit can. He'll help you to realize he came to give you the gift of eternal life, to give you his spirit, to give you his attitude. To, and while should we be? We call him father, father. So like father, like son, like daughter, we should be like Jesus. We need to have his compassion. We need to have his forgiveness. We need to forgive, 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 love, love, love. And sometimes forgiveness is difficult. It is for me, but he gives me his forgiveness. He helps me forgive. He'll help you forgive. Sometimes we have hard things to forgive, but God was a forgiver. He forgave all of our sins. Now he wants us to reflect him. He wants us to be like Jesus. He wants us to reflect God, reflect our Father that forgives our sins. Because of Christ, he forgives our sins. He wants you to forgive everybody. Forgive that you might be like him and to have his blessing. He says, you forgive because I forgave you. You know, I, I don't want to even tell, but I've had hard things to forgive. But I've asked God, give me your forgiveness. You've got hard things to forgive. Because after I had pastored 40 years in a church, the pastor that followed me took me out to dinner. And I was away, took me out to dinner and says, and we aren't going to give you anything. We have decided not to do anything for you. After 40 years, we had pastored there. They took us out to dinner, took me out. And at the end of a nice meal, he says, but we have decided I'm not going to give you anything. In fact, all the people that are like you, that are for you, I'm driving them out of the church. I don't want any Crandallites in the church. I'm, I'm, and I had to forgive him. And, and I want to be careful to tell it because I want to forgive him. I don't want you to hold it against him. I say, God, forgive him because you forgave me. I forgive him. I forgive them. I forgive everybody. <laughs> Hallelujah. No, no, no. Don't hold it. Don't say how bad. Yes, bad. But we forgive everybody because he forgave us, folks. He forgave us and we are going to reflect him. Come on, shout the victory. We are going to reflect him. Hallelujah. So forgive, forgive, forgive and have compassion. And I want to wind up with a couple of, with a story of compassion. Have compassion on people. Lillian Trasher who spoke right here in New York at 33rd Street years ago. That's a, a generation ago. You folks wouldn't know her. But Lillian Trasher felt a, to be a missionary to, the, to Egypt. Went down on, way down on the Nile River to Asiat, a little city by Asiat, Egypt. And she was working with some other missionaries there. A young lady, single. And she was walking in the street one day and she saw this baby, dirty, left on the street to die. And she said, I can't pass that baby by, just a little baby. And she reached over and picked that baby up, brought him home. No, that was a boy or girl the first one. I don't know, boys and girls. Washed him, washed her, clothed her, got her clothes for her, fed her, and took care of her. She's out a few days later, another one. She got five or six of these little babies and these missionaries that she was staying with said, we can't have those crying babies in this house. You'll have to get out. We, did, we come here to do something important. Can you imagine that? We came here to do something important. And you spending your time with these dying babies. And Lillian Trasher went out, rented a house, rented a, an apartment in, in Egypt. A stranger, a girl, young girl, took care of those babies. Didn't have any money. Prayed every day. Food came in every day. Somehow or another, she fed those babies. She got more babies. It grew and grew. Lillian Trasher had a thousand children in her home. And from for 20 some years, when she had breakfast, she never knew where supper was coming from. But was, I don't remember how many, 23 or more. And never did she miss a meal. 
Somehow the food came for those thousand children every day. <laughs> compassion, compassion. And I heard her tell the story and just heard her say that she said, when I got a lot of help and people came and helped us and we had buildings and we had finances and our money, but I always kept the babies because I could hear a crying baby. Like those young missionaries couldn't hear them. But she said, never a baby cried that I didn't hear him and get up and take care of him in the night. Compassion, compassion. God's compassion. Royalty came to visit when they were visiting from England, visiting Egypt years ago, came to visit the home. She took them around and when they got through, she said, I apologize. I don't know how to handle royalty. If I have offended you or have done something that I should, they said, Mrs. Thrasher, let us apologize. If we've offended you, we're the ones that should worry about offending people. You are so much like God. Compassion. That's what we've got to have, folks, is compassion. Care about people. God is a caring God, a loving God. Calvary. Now, he loves us that he's given us eternal life, that we are going to be with him forever and ever and ever. This life is quick. It's passing. I don't care how young you are. I'm 88. It goes fast. Mine's coming to an end shortly. But it's gone quick like that. But eternity, when we wake up with him forever and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Oh, what a blessing it's going to be. What a choir it's going to be, folks. Get ready to sing in the heaven's choir. Hallelujah. Because it's going to last. This is a passing life. But get God's love, God's forgiveness, God's compassion. Reflect him. Read those gospels. Absorb that spirit. What Jesus was is what God is. That's how we know who he is. And we come through him because we are cleansed through him. He gave us his name and he gives us the gift of eternal life. And we ask you this morning, reach for him for whatever you need, for homes, houses, food, whatever. He cares. He understands. He's filled with compassion and he's a loving God. And get ready to meet him forever and ever. Pastor, you come and lead us in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.